In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of formation of the traditional enforceable contract. Specifically, we're moving past mutual assent into our introduction to consideration. But before we jump into that, as a quick refresher, how do we go about forming a traditional enforceable contract? Remember, we have three elements. We need mutual assent between the parties, consideration, and no defenses to formation that would invalidate the otherwise valid contract. In case you're wondering where we are in the big picture flow of our contract law analysis, we're still talking about formation of the traditional enforceable contract. We're moving past mutual assent onto the C and my cats do sneak. Of course, this C stands for consideration. Okay, so at this point, just to review again, we've talked about how we determine whether there's mutual assent between the parties. This has been the primary focus focus of our videos up until this point. And remember, we said that to have mutual assent between the parties, all we need is a valid offer and a valid acceptance of that offer. Once we have an offer and acceptance, we know we have mutual assent between the parties. The only question left in our traditional enforceable contract formation analysis is whether this mutual assent, this offer and acceptance is supported by consideration. If we have an offer and an acceptance and that agreement is supported by consideration, we have a traditional enforceable contract unless that could be invalidated by a possible defense to formation, which we'll talk about in future videos. But the main two requirements are going to be that we have that offer and acceptance and that offer and acceptance or that agreement is supported by consideration. Once we have those two things, we say we have a traditional enforceable contract and that contract's going to be enforceable in court unless there is a defense to formation that could invalidate it, which we'll talk about later, right? But that's where we are in the big picture, right? When we're talking about consideration. So how do we determine whether the offer and acceptance is supported by consideration? Well, there's going to be two main elements or two requirements, right? The idea here is that we need legal value involved in the offer and acceptance in a bargained for exchange, right? Legal value just meaning that the promisee is incurring a legal detriment or the promisor is receiving a legal benefit. And this idea of the bargain for exchange or reciprocal inducement, just meaning that the promise induces the detriment and the detriment induces the promise. If we have this type of reciprocal inducement, we say that we have a bargain for exchange exchange, if we have legal value and a bargain for exchange, then we're going to say consideration is present. So let's just run through some examples, right? This is the easiest way to see consideration. Let's start with a really basic example and then kind of add on to it and see what happens. Okay. So let's say sticking with the example we've been using, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5 and you say, I accept. Well, we know that that's a valid offer and a valid acceptance. So we have mutual assent between the parties. Our next question in our contract formation for a traditional enforceable contract is going to be whether that mutual assent or that agreement is supported by consideration. So how do we do that? we're gonna to have to run through our two elements, but let's draw it out on the board and talk about it, right? So I here am the promisor. I'm promising you a dry erase marker. So we'll put the promise in blue, just to color code this a little bit. So I am promising you the dry erase marker in exchange for $5, right? In exchange for $5. This is our mutual cent offer and acceptance, right? I'm offering you the dry erase marker for $5 and you've accepted, right? So here, running through our elements, number one, has the promisee, you, incurred a legal detriment. So what is a legal detriment, right? We have this written up here with this idea of the legal detriment and a legal benefit. A legal detriment is simply either an action or a forbearance. It's either where the promisee is taking an action that they are not otherwise legally obligated to undertake or they're forbearing from something that they're legally permitted to do, right? So the question here is going to be, 
has the promise number one if we're determining whether or not there's consideration our first question under our first element is whether the promise has incurred a legal detriment well is the promise taking an action that they would otherwise not be legally obligated to undertake Yes, the promisee is paying $5 to me that the promisee has no legal obligation to otherwise pay. So the promisee is incurring a legal detriment of $5, right? It's $5 that this promisee or you in this example have no legal obligation to pay me. So that's a legal detriment of $5. Now, has the promisor received a legal benefit? Right, obviously, the promisor is me, is receiving the $5. So I am receiving the benefit of $5. I'm not otherwise entitled to this $5. I'm receiving it, right? So I'm clearly getting a $5 benefit. Now, one thing worth noting before we move on to our second element is that when you're focusing on this, you always want to start with whether or not the promisee has incurred a legal detriment. This is by far the more important part of the first element. This idea of whether the promisor receives a legal benefit actually in a majority of courts isn't even discussed, right? A majority of courts in the United States have dropped this requirement from the first element and the courts that do apply this as it's written put more emphasis on the first part as to whether the promisee is incurring a legal detriment. So my recommendation to everyone who's applying consideration to a contract law fact pattern is to write this rule as you see it because this is the traditional rule and this is how it is taught so it's going to give the correct nod to your contract law grader but as you go through your analysis in your head you can basically ignore this second half of the first element it's good to note it's good to think about but honestly we're what you're going to want to do just to make it simple on yourself and from my experience, again, having worked through hundreds of these, if not thousands of contract law fact patterns, the better move is to think about whether the promisee is incurring a legal detriment first, and then you can kind of think about the benefit to the promisor, okay? But again, so going back to this example, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. You say, I accept. Your legal detriment as the promisee, you're paying me $5 that you have no legal obligation to otherwise pay me. So the promisee has incurred the legal detriment of $5. We can say that my benefit, the promisor, is that same $5. But moving on to the second element, right? Do we have a bargain for exchange? We know that the promisee is incurring a legal detriment. So the next question is, so we have this legal value element satisfied. The next question is, do we have a bargain for exchange? Well, is the promise inducing the detriment? Is my promise of the dry erase marker inducing you, the promisee, to pay me $5? Yes, right? You're not just giving me $5 out of the kindness of your heart. The promisee is induced to give up the $5 because he wants to get the dry erase marker, right? So the first half of this is satisfied. And does the detriment induce the promise, right? Is the $5 the reason that I'm giving you the dry erase marker? Yeah, I'm not just giving you the dry erase marker out of the kindness of my heart. I'm giving you the dry erase marker because I want the $5. I'm induced as the promisor by your detriment, right? So we have reciprocal inducement, which means we have a bargained for exchange. The promise of the dry erase marker induces you to take on the detriment of paying me $5. And the detriment of paying me $5 induces me, the promisor, to promise you the dry erase marker. This is the clearest and easiest example of consideration. In any court in the United States, this is very clear cut consideration, right? So this is, we have clear legal value, the $5, 
clear reciprocal inducement and bargained for exchange. So this works. So in this example, we have mutual assent between the parties. We have offer and acceptance. We have consideration. We, that means right there, we have a traditional enforceable contract so long as there's not a defense that could otherwise invalidate it, right? But assuming that there's no defenses that invalidate the contract, then we have a traditional enforceable contract, right? Mutual assent supported by consideration. All right, but let's change this up a little bit and give you some examples of what might not be consideration, okay? So let's stick with the same example, right? But this time, let's say that instead of selling you the dry erase marker for $5, I'm just giving it to you, right? So let's say here, this time, right, for the next example, me, the promisor, I am offering to give you this dry erase marker for free, right? And you say, I accept. Well, do we have mutual assent? We have an offer and acceptance. I'm offering to give you this dry erase marker for free. You say, I accept. So we arguably have mutual assent, right? Offer and acceptance. The next question is, well, is, it, is that agreement, that offer and acceptance, supported by consideration? Well, what's, do we have the promise? What's our first question, right? If we go to our first element, will, is there legal value at stake in this agreement? Our first element asks, does the promisee incur a legal detriment? Is the promisee taking an action that they would otherwise not be legally obligated to take? Or is the promisee forbearing from participating in something that they are legally permitted to participate in, right? Here, well, is the promisee taking an action or forbearing? No, the promisee is doing nothing, right? So literally, the detriment does not exist because the promisee is not taking an action, is not forbearing from anything. The promisee is literally just receiving a dry erase marker for doing nothing or from forbearing from anything. So in this case, immediately our first element is not satisfied. The promisee is not incurring any type of legal detriment. And we could ask whether the promisor is receiving a legal benefit. Here, the promisor is not getting anything in return, right? Just he's giving away the dry erase marker for nothing. So there would be no benefit to the promisor. So we don't have any value exchange happening here. So it can't be bargained for. In this case, we do not have consideration. This is called a gift promise, right? This is our first form of what is not consideration, right? I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for free and you say, I accept. We might have mutual assent, right? We might have offer and acceptance, but we do not have consideration. That agreement is not supported by consideration. Therefore, we do not have a traditional enforceable contract. That's a gift promise, right? Important to recognize, again, as we've talked about before, just because you don't have a traditional enforceable contract doesn't mean it's impossible for the plaintiff to recover. Remember, there's always this idea of alternative theories, promissory estoppel, quasi-contracts, moral obligations, right? And we'll talk about these alternative theories later. But right now, we're talking about the traditional enforceable contract. And a traditional enforceable contract is only going to be enforced in court if we have an offer and acceptance supported by consideration. This example, we do not have that, right? No consideration, no traditional enforceable contract. Okay, so the next type of example that's worth exploring is the conditional gift. So let's say that I offer to sell you this dry, or let's say I offer to give you this dry erase marker for free, but I say you have to come to my house and pick it up, right? That's my deal. I say, I offer to give you this dry erase marker for free, but you got to come by my house and pick it up, right? So I'm promising you the dry erase marker for free, but you have to come and pick it up, okay? So again, here, starting with our first question, is the promisee incurring a legal detriment? Well, 
The promisee could argue that he does have to take an action that he's otherwise not required to take, right? The promisee is having to spend the gas. Let's say you live 30 minutes from me. So you have to get in your car and drive to my house. That's going to take you, you know, 30 minutes of time and you have to spend that gas money. So we have you arguably incurring the legal detriment of gas money because you're taking an action that you would otherwise not be legally obligated to take, right? And that under the traditional meaning of legal value in the legal detriment could arguably be a legal detriment. Now, in modern court, whether that would work as an argument is flimsy, but for our purposes under the traditional definition of the legal detriment, right? Spending the gas money could be arguably something, an action that the promisee is not legally obligated to undertake. So yeah, they're spending that gas money, right? So maybe this first element is satisfied, right? And the idea of whether the promisor is receiving a benefit, yeah, probably not, right? The promisor isn't getting anything out of this. He's just giving away a dry erase marker. Promise he's coming to pick it up. Promisor is not getting a benefit. Remember though, we don't really care necessarily about this second half, right? Because this element is satisfied if we're saying the promisee is incurring a detriment because of this operative or word, right? So here, first element, let's just say under the traditional approach, like you would on a contract law fact pattern, okay, maybe the promisee is incurring a legal detriment, taking an action they would otherwise not have a legal obligation to take, right? Well, let's think about this second element. Do we have a bargained for exchange? Does the promise induce the detriment? Well, yeah, here, right? The promise of the dry erase marker is the reason that the promisee is spending the gas money, taking the action to come and pick it up. The promisee isn't just spending the gas money and getting in their car and driving for no reason. The promisee wants the dry erase marker. So the first half of this is satisfied. The promise does induce the detriment. But does the detriment induce the promise? Is the promisor making this promise of the dry erase marker because he's interested in the promise he's spending gas money, right? No, right? The promisor does not care about the promise he getting in the car and spending the gas money. For all the promisor knows, the promise he could live next door, right? The promisor just doesn't want to get in his car and drive himself and deal with it, but he's not actually induced by the promise he's action, right? This spending of gas money is completely irrelevant to the promisor, so we do not have reciprocal inducement. Even though the promise of the dry erase marker is inducing the promisee to get in his car and drive over, that is not the reason that action is not inducing the promisor to make the promise of the dry erase marker. Therefore, we do not have a bargained for exchange. Therefore, this is not consideration. No traditional enforceable contract. And we call this a conditional gift, right? Conditional gifts are not consideration. And it's just the idea where the promisor is not actually being induced by the promisee's detriment, right? That's a conditional gift. The promisor is ostensibly giving this dry erase marker to the promisee as a gift out of the kindness of his heart. He doesn't care about what action the promisee is taking, right? Now, we could change this fact pattern, right? Imagine that instead of a dry erase marker, let's say it's a massive grand piano, right? The promisor is moving and he needs this huge grand piano lifted and moved out of his house, right? And if you don't know about moving grand pianos, I can say from personal experience, it is a very difficult task. Pianos are extremely heavy, right? So you would have to hire a professional moving company generally to move a grand piano. So. Let's say that the promisor in this case is promising that grand piano, right? You can attempt to draw that. These are some keys, right? Grand piano for free, right? So the promisor says, hey, you can have my piano for free on the condition that you come and pick it up and move it out of my house. You know, you have to get the moving van, all the dollies and equipment and come move it out of my house. Okay, so he's giving away, Promisor is giving away the grand piano for free, but 
In exchange, the promisee has to go get a moving van and all the piano moving equipment, the dolly, whatever. Right, so we'll just say here that the detriment to the promisee in that case, right, because that's going to be our first question, does the promisee incur a legal detriment? Well, yeah, right, he's got to go get a moving van, all the moving equipment. So we'll just write moving equipment, right, that he would otherwise not have to get, right? So that is a legal detriment going out taking the action of getting all the moving equipment and then showing up to the house and moving the piano. That's all actions that the promisee would otherwise not be legally obligated to perform. So the promisee is incurring a legal detriment, right? So we know, okay, first element is satisfied. And is the promisor receiving a legal benefit though, just to cover our bases and talk about it? Because that's what the traditional approach would be. Well, yeah, the promisor here is getting the legal benefit of having the piano moved, right? That has value. Piano is moved, right? He's trying to get everything out of his house. He's trying to move to a different location. He's getting the piano out. Hiring a crew to come and do this would cost a lot of money. Now he's saving that money by getting this promisee to come and do it for him. So promisee gets the piano and the promisor is getting the benefit of having it moved out of his house. Now, so we know the first element was satisfied last time though. Let's move on to the second element. Does the promise induce the detriment? Does the promise of the grand piano induce the promisee to come and pick it up? Yeah, the promisee's not just coming to move the piano out of the kindness of his heart. Right? He wants that grand piano. Grand piano is worth a lot of money. He wants to come and get it, right? And does the detriment induce the promise, right? Does the moving of this induce, does the promisee coming to pick up and move the grand piano induce the promisor to offer to give it to the promisee for free? Yes, right? The promisor isn't just doing this out of the kindness of his heart. He needs the piano moved. Otherwise, he'd have to go pay a lot of money and hire a crew to move it. So he is induced by the promisee coming to pick it up. That's the reason he's making his promise, right? So hopefully you can see the difference there. That would not be a conditional gift. So just because you're giving something away for free on a condition, right, that doesn't necessarily mean it's always a conditional gift. You just wanna ask, right, the key will always be in this reciprocal inducement. Was it a bargain for exchange? Was the promisor induced by the, was the promisor induced to make the promise by the detriment, right? And that will give you the answer that you're looking for. Just something to recognize there though, I think most people can easily see the difference between, hey, I'll give you a dry erase marker for free, but you gotta come and pick it up, versus I have this grand piano that's extremely difficult to move that I would have to hire a crew, you know, $500 to come and move, but if you come and pick it up for me, I'll give it to you for free, right? Big difference there between those fact patterns. So if you can see that, you're in good shape. Just recognize that a true conditional gift where the detriment does not induce the promise right, is not going to be consideration. That's the situation where you have a promisor saying, I'll give you the dry erase marker for free, but you have to come and pick it up, right? That's a conditional gift because the promisor is not being induced by the promisee's action, right? By the promisee's detriment, okay? So next we have pre-existing legal duties, right, okay? So we're gonna talk about the pre-existing legal duty rule Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.